Take two. Meter, head. What? Banging off the leg. What? <laughs> In your own time. Shot one, take two. Today it's a very... No, I'll do that again. Oh, <laughs> that's laughing. <laughs> Paulie Yates was probably next to Princess Diana, the most famous female in England. When she walked in a room, she was like a firecracker. <laughs> and she was great and irreverent. Have you reached your peak now, or are you getting bigger? <laughs> <laughs> Trailblazer and the absolute epitome of charismatic. I'm in Grandmaster Flash's dressing room, which is why I'm talking a bit funny, because it's making me actually quite nervous. <laughs> Surely feminism was the point is that you get a choice. You don't have to have it all and do it all. You can choose. She was a kind of a chameleon and a sort of maverick and a kind of self-invented person. Paula Yates is probably better known for her private life than for her TV career. Every twist and turn of her problems was front page news. I think there was a sense that she was the original wild child, she linked up with a rock star, linked up with another rock star. That rock star has this tragic death, and this, the person at the centre of it had it come to her and was the cause of it all. The rock star Michael Hutchins was found hanging from a door in the Sydney hotel room. When I spoke to her, the opposite was true. into the room and the room was just completely still and Paula was sitting at this table. You all seem to be under siege. When relentlessly, you very, very relentlessly under siege yeah. with 60 photographers sometimes outside, you know. It's unimaginable what goes on. Nobody prepares you for this. You don't get a textbook for this. You just do the best you can. You know, it just so helps them having to do it in public. Presented for the first time by Page Three Girl today. Meow. through your head thinking about now. Does it feel like a long time ago? It's strangely emotional. As soon as I sit down in this chair, I just wanted to cry. So it's the weirdest feeling. It's quite very emotional, yeah. Um, I wrote a song about her. Um, and I've never said it's about her at all to anybody. It's a song called Cursed. And uh, there's a lyric in it that goes, told everybody I'd slept with you. Thought you'd like it, knew you wouldn't deny it. It's not true. So if anybody goes and checks that song out... But it's true that she wouldn't have denied it. She wouldn't have denied it, no. No. <laughs> That's enough about that. watching. Um, what was the nature of your relationship? The nature of our relationship? What was the nature of our relationship? I suppose she would be a confidant... In order to be a good lover, mm. do you think there's any particular things that people should do? Or oh, use lubrication. Easily. <laughs> <laughs> hey, older sister. Do you find girls a great inspiration? I mean, are, are lots of your songs written about girls? Of course. She was incredibly smart, incredibly engaging. I've gone all red. You're in enough trouble as it is. Why? <laughs> and somebody that was just fascinating to be around. Don't keep pulling me. I'm not, you know, I'm just like, just, you know, an object. You know, I'm a person. According to a recent survey in Teenage Magazine, more girls would like to look like my final guest tonight than the Princess of Wales. Her face appeared on more front covers than any other models last year. She's a journalist, an author, a businesswoman, and she's still in her 20s. Ladies and gentlemen, Paula Yates. 
I mean, dreadfully conventional. I mean, I read romantic novels, which I buy and I hide under a pile of serious novels because I'm embarrassed to buy them. I collect pictures of Prince Andrew and his chopper. <laughs> and I'm frightfully keen on Doris Day films. Well, the ones with Rock Hudson, because then I pretend it's you and me. When I first met Paula, which is like the late 70s, I was a music journalist doing reviews for Record Mirror. And Paula Yates was, uh, was a columnist. So the first time I went in there, she was sitting in the corner, banging away, trying to get this column. I subsequently found out that she was always slightly late with her copy. So I guess she was sort of behind on a deadline or something. Was she quite intimidating? She was quite unapproachable, um, fiercely intelligent. She was someone who really knew what she wanted and she knew how to get what she wanted as well. So there was a certain kind of authority about her that I think was, a, was attractive. Certainly, I noticed her the moment I walked in. I mean, she was quite a kind of exotic figure with the peroxide hair and she knew everybody. I mean, really, really well connected, which, you know, for us, I was sort of 18, 19, you know, we were sort of in awe of that. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be able to say to you, welcome to Channel 4. Britain's first new network for 18 years went on the air as scheduled at a quarter to five. One day on Channel 4, a pop show broadcasting from Newcastle arrives. You know, bands are coming on and they're playing live and it's bumpy and it's weird. And then Polly Yates appears and she looks incredible. Well, here it is, the studio where it's all going to be happening. For the next five months, you're going to be able to see live music, interviews. It was a pivotal part of my life. I must have been seven or eight years old. You know, you looked on television, I didn't want to be a Blue Peter presenter. They are such lovely colours, you They're see, green. aren't they? Just like a bishop's mitre. Mm. Mm. I didn't want to be Anne Diamond. I don't want to be the girls on Miss World. For me, Polly Yates was an icon. She was everything, all plates spinning at once. Everything a modern woman could be. But you can tell that this is live television because I am sitting on my foot because I wasn't allowed to go to the loo before the show started. However, there are so many girls on tonight's show that even the crew came out of the pub early and the whole place has the overpoweringly erotic smell of brute. She flirts and she's sexy and uh, it wasn't just kind of harmless, coy kind of Princess Diana flirting. This was proper sexual Marilyn Monroe uh, but mixed with kind of an enemy, cool slant. Now tell me, Sting, what we really want to know is how come you get your gear off so often? Virtually every picture, you've got your shirt off, so come on. I come. Well, I don't know. It's... <laughs> that was part of the magic of her, that every time she appeared on television interviewing some gorgeous, sexy man, you could almost feel her playing footsie. Under the, ta <laughs> under the table. Our next group I'm not allowed to introduce because you might have thought that the lead singer had given me one. It was in fact, the lead singer, the lead singer in fact did give me one of these records, which are their brand new records. The Boontown Rats had come along and they had this singer with real attitude, which was Geldof, this kind of real you know, kind of Jack the Lad, kind of like an Irish Jagger, but a bit cooler than Mick Jagger was back then. And so when Paula came along and hooked up with him, Bob Geldof was a big thing, and Paulie Yates being his girlfriend, she was a big thing as well. I'm supposed to be a pin-up star um, who has a pretty girlfriend for the daily pop papers, I'm supposed to be Bob Goloff, rock star. Uh, it's supposed to be like Rod and Brit or Mick and Bianca, and it's not even Mick and Marianne. Let's meet the lady in your life. 
TV pop presenter Paulie Ace. Paula, did romance blossom right away? Well, it did for me, but it didn't really for him. The first time I saw him, he had these incredibly tight red trousers sort of sprayed on, and a black jumper, and a plastic fried egg, and a, the Lord's Prayer tied to his jumper with a bit of string. And I thought, gosh, there's a hunk. <laughs> well, Bob Geldof, hunk. Paulie Yates was probably my best friend. We must have met in the 80s sometime. And we lived very near each other, like literally in the next street. She was pregnant and I was pregnant at the same time. And that's kind of was more of a bond. And then when the kids were little, when we used to take them to the one o'clock club at Battersea and hang out. And that's kind of how we became friends. Of course, they made it for me just after I'd had my baby. And of course, the minute I'd had her, I wanted everything to be skin tight and have to be wedged into it with a shoehorn. She was kind of like a cross between Marilyn Monroe and Mary Poppins, you know? That's how I think of her, really. She was an incredibly good mother, incredibly kind, very loyal to her friends, extraordinarily well-read. I mean, extraordinary, you know, you could ask her, Whatever the conversation was, Paula not just had an opinion, but definitely had knowledge or whatever you were talking about. Um, but she kind of came across as a ditzy blonde, but she definitely wasn't. She needed somebody who had her back and who understood her and was a friend. So yeah, we had a lot of fun. Just kind of do normal things you do with your friends. And then Things changed, yeah. Detectives say they're baffled about the circumstances of the death of rock star Michael Hutchins. His partner, the TV presenter Paula Yates, is in London and is expected to fly out to Australia this evening. I was the editor of OK Magazine, which is this national celebrity magazine. When Michael Hutchins died, I saw a front page of The Sun and it was all about Paula's grief and this, that and the other. And suddenly a light bulb lit up in my head and I thought, first interview with her would be really good. I found out that Paula had this sort of right-hand woman called Belinda Bruin, called her and said, look, you know, I'd be really interested in doing the first interview with Paula. I hadn't seen her face to face for 20 years. And here she was, not looking terribly different as a person, but her body language and her kind of general demeanor was just broken, really. I'm not that old, and yet I just think this is it. To be this lonely, this is it. And if anything, it gets worse every day. So I may seem calmer, I obviously am calmer, but I'm much more unhappy. The price my family is paying, it's unbearable, it's just literally unbearable to us all and to me it's just almost unlivable on a day on a day-to-day -day basis michael was her love well she never got over it i i don't think people do they just learn to live with it paula didn't really learn to live with it that was the problem it was a big black cloud every single day and to, 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 to get away from that was very hard. Well, what do you think? I mean, people keep saying to me, you know... She'll die. No, Everyone says that to me. I know they do. It's kind of a weird feeling that everyone's waiting for you to die. You know, you know the story about I got sent my um, 
obituary by accident by one of the tabloids. Headline Suicide Blonde. You go out with people that you meet in your work. And the people I met were in bands. Mm. So that's the way it went. I was Instant. born to, to stand at the side of the stadium <laughs> wearing an apron. <laughs> but I can't imagine ever having me go out with anyone who couldn't fill a stadium. Shot three, take one. What's wrong? No, no nothing's wrong at all. There's just a bit of stuff that wouldn't be in shot that's over there. Mm. In your own time, my love. It's Christmas time. It all started just eight months ago when a contingent of 40 British rock stars got together at a studio in London to record Do They Know It's Christmas? The sole purpose being to raise money for the starving Ethiopians. When Bob Geldof thought of the idea for the Band Aid single, he rather expected it would make about 70. Sorry. What is wrong with me? Just start again. Just start again. Well, it's because I'm seeing people. Okay. Just start again. Please. What? Do you think I, I suddenly that's why I had me pause? Because I was a bit worried. Do you think they, they all know I live with him? Yeah, of course they know you live with him. Yeah. I don't really want yeah. to act like I'm being. No, no, of no, course no. you don't know. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to London, to Wembley and Live Aid. Will you meet and greet David Bowie? I can still remember the whole day of watching Live Aid, as if it was yesterday. All the big pop names of the time in Wembley Stadium. Live Aid was one of the most important and far-reaching charity ventures that the world has ever seen. By noon, 72,000 rock fans were packed into Wembley Stadium as Live Aid began in brilliant sunshine. The princess, a keen pop fan, apparently needed little persuading to join the huge audience. They were this iconic couple. They were both groundbreaking in their own rights. Um, I mean, I remember we were on the Fulham Road and we went into, there's a jewellery shop there, and we went in and Princess Diana was in there. And Princess Diana said to Paula, I love it when you're on the front page of the papers because it means I've got the day off. Bob Geldof, the rock star and inspiration behind Band Aid, Live Aid and Sport Aid, received a personal reward for his work this morning when the Queen presented him with an honorary knighthood. Basically, these diaries came along in The Sun, The Standard, The Mirror, which were daily showbiz diaries. And it was the first, if you like, daily monitoring of national British showbiz. And we were basically just filling the news, trying to fill the newspapers every day with showbiz gossip and pop gossip. And that was the massive change that Paula and Bob were in the middle of. The Geldofs, because they would be people that, just like myself, would be keeping an eye on. If they had a row or there was a you know, bust up and they'd be photographed, there'd be people trying to get words with them. It was a lot of chasing around. <laughs> getting into cabs and, you know, getting pictures quickly developed for the next morning and all that stuff. It was, it was a great time to be a journalist, actually. Blonde and blondes. And you've wanted to be a blonde since how old? Since I was six, but my mother, sensibly enough, wouldn't let me. Sorry, I was just having a quick... And what she did so. instead was she had this blonde wig, and I used to wear it all the time. Finally, a halt was put to the, the wig borrowing because I arrived at one of her dinner parties wearing the wig, came down the stairs, Winsiette pyjamas, wig, and her diaphragm on the top of my head. <laughs> so that was that. The wig was snatched away. That was the end of that. That was the end so. of that. So when did you actually become blonde yourself? I became blonde when I was 12. The real blonde, the blonde that went... Like this. Yeah. yeah. She came in very much in her style that was, you know, 50s dress and peroxide hair. And she was great and irreverent. And, you know, I can remember all those days of, like, you know, David Bowie coming in and Paul Yates trying to pay with a plastic bag full of change and things like that. I saw her a lot, three times a week, four times a week. It was every shoot that she did, and she did a lot. 
nobody else did a hair. Um, really, the whole way through? No, not at all. Not at all. And I can't say that for everybody. I mean... Did you become friends? Yeah, we did. I think, you know, you can't work for that long, know that much, and not become a friend. Um, yeah, she'd be quite frivolous. I mean, I mean, I can remember I got a call from Bob at, like, 7 in the morning, and it was more or less on the lines of, of fuck's sake, can you get here? Because she's not having this baby until she's had her hair done. But that was her way of doing it. And, of course, she did. When she came out and presented herself to the world, she, on you know, each of the occasions of... A birth I was in full Paula regalia, you know, hair done and you know, I'm ready for the cameras. So that was her. I suppose she just knew her market. Today is the day, of course, my perfume comes out. Yes. Would you like to sniff me? <laughs> it's, um... Are you uncontrollable? <laughs> Terry, it? it's strong. be honest. I'll say it that is point. potent. It is a pot potent. It's a good word, yes. Sorry. Powerful. I'm utterly thrilled with it because of the effect it has on men. Yeah. <laughs> Paula is doing what is now, through today's eyes, incredibly natural. You have a perfume and you have a, a lingerie brand. They're just spin-off things. You know, you, you make money, you bank. You bank money. That's coming out and then followed by my underwear. Followed by the underwear. I know. So, Paula Yates smells in her underwear. <laughs> You know, before Kim Kardashian, there was Paula. Did you get a sense that she was happy? I really don't want to get into the Bob and Paula stuff, really, I don't. At the time, there were allegations about both of them in the press. Well, Paula Yates didn't just date and marry a rock star. She lived a life like a rock star, almost like a male rock star. And the rumors would always be that she was basically shagging every single one of these men. I don't know if she did. I hope she did, because these were some of the most gorgeous and sexy, virile men in their prime of the 80s. Every once in a while, the tube does something to make everyone happy, and this is it. So you have to put down your baked beans, you have to stand up in your living room, you have to take off your vest because you're going to get so hot, because it's just the best singer you're going to see all year. That's it, there we go. Okay. Terence Trent Darby has got a voice that you just want to kill for, and here he is in his first TV performance with his debut single, If You Let Me Stay. My name is Sinanda Maitreya. I was previously known in another life is, is another thing. First, let me just say that through the subsequent 35 years, I've been asked about Holly Yates on numerous occasions, and I've always refused to talk about her. But it's a relief to finally have this outlet to, um, to talk about and celebrate her life. Do you remember meeting Paula? Yes, I do remember meeting the madam. Uh, the first time I met her was before I went on stage for the, my first appearance on the tube. What, was, what were your first impressions? Uh, my first impressions of her were what you would expect from a 24, 25-year-old. You know, wow, she's, she's hot. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, the business is full of beautiful women, but the ones who have made the impact that she she had on the culture at the time. There's something else there. He originally came up to do six songs and uh, two songs and did six, and I can hardly speak. I'm so excited. We have a bit of a thing. I didn't have a bit of a thing. I had an affair with Chance for a year of my life. It's quite a long time. It's very serious. Yeah. He loved me. I loved him. Yeah. You're the first person I've told. So I'm in a hotel in New York, and uh, I get this call from the front desk telling me that there's a gentleman downstairs who would very much like to meet with me. The gentleman says his name is Bob Geldof. Fuck. And it was something along the lines of, so what's this about you and my wife then? Are you nobbing my wife? So, of course, I did what any other self-respecting 
you know, a 25-year-old man would do, and I fucking lied to him. And what do you think about the comparisons that have been made about you and uh, with Prince and, and people like Michael Jackson? Um, I think with Prince, to be fair, a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're both of similar complexion. I don't want to see it. You can read it. I'll read it. It's from Page. It's News of the World. It just says, Bob's Paula caught with Black Star. And it's really shocking to see it from this perspective. Yes. Was race an, an element of that criticism that you faced, that story? We're an Anglo-based culture. How can it not? How can it not? The whole news of the world, Paul caught with Black Star, and manipulating that for, for, for public retribution. I was going to pay for that. I did. She was going to pay for that. She did. But I look at I look at Terence now and I think he's too fucker because she got put through all this crap. Mm. A terrible trouble here. Virtually she destroy this career. Mm. Why? Over here, there's all the scandal about me. What is it? I do believe that connected with that whole Bob and Paula thing, there were the knives out ready to carve me into Thanksgiving turkey. And that's subsequently what I experienced. Yeah, I don't think in terms of rating, I just think in terms of getting my links right. I'll just be you know, extremely relieved if it all goes smoothly, you know, to begin with. The new £10 million five mornings a week Channel 4 Big Breakfast will have a combination of studio activities and live broadcast events with ITN news bulletins popping up too. The format, insofar as there is one, is very much along the lines of television youth programmes, a sort of slam-bang gotcha style of presentation. One of the things that I think is great with this is it's so casey. Everything just rollocks along. Very nice, isn't it? Hello. So shocking to see you not outside our house. I know. It's nice really weird. Again. At today's launch, Bob Geldof, the big name behind the new show, wasn't around, but his wife, Paula Yates, a presenter on The Big Breakfast, was. It is terrible in the morning. Are you good in the morning? I'm really sickeningly good. Like, you know, those vomity people that wake up and sing selections from Rogers and Hammerstone very loudly up and down the stairs. Is it true you had an affair with Prince? No, Prince is, has been a, Did an you idol him? of mine. No. Oh, come on! No! I don't <laughs> believe that anyone else carried out their interviews on a double bed. I mean, that was very much her sense of humour. She loved that. That's my meaningful. <laughs> yeah, she always used to say to me, I'll never interview anybody less famous than myself. And she asked the kind of questions, naughty kind of questions, flirty kind of questions. You promised me you wouldn't wear that dress again. No, but you said you wouldn't wear yours. <laughs> The big breakfast bed was somehow this kind of sexy detonator. You wouldn't be Wolf Mother with a howl like that. I could do a bigger howl if I got revved up. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, Hello. She became absolutely sort of key and crucial to it and emblematic of it in a way because Paula Yates was the on the bed person, on the bed with Paula. And there she would be interviewing the great big stars of the time. Come on, give me some marriage tips, big boy. All right. And she would give these incredibly sparky, spirited interviews. It's not quite the same, though, is it, saying you were doing well in Belgium? It's like saying I was doing very well in Cleethorpes. Right, <laughs> isn't right, it? Right, right. I mean, Belgium's quite dull, isn't it? And she did it by seducing every single person <laughs> on the bed. It didn't matter who it was, whoever it was, she would flirt shamelessly, and she was irresistible. Is it true you've got three nipples? Yes, it is. Is it true you have three nipples? No, I don't. I don't have this unusual asset. It would be wrong to think that um, the on-the-bed interviews were all kind of jokey and light-hearted and frothy and superficial, because actually they weren't. Do you get um, upset? Because some of the criticism does insinuate that you're sort of too volavant short of the full buffet. Somehow or other, being on the bed meant that people would talk in a very open way about all sorts of things. And Paula was expert, actually, at, at really getting to the root of an interview and getting to the really interesting stuff. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. Everybody can do drag. You know? But what attracted you to it in the first place? I mean, when was that moment where you suddenly thought, 
pay. I'm going to put on girls' knickers. <laughs> of course, this was all before nine o'clock in the morning, and therefore it was a kind of um, revolutionary television, a kind of masquerading as light entertainment, but really having sometimes a very serious kernel. They make you cross that it's not easier for gay men to get a baby when they'd probably make very good dads. I think it's just the way things are, really. It will change. How quickly? Probably within 10 years. Do you remember meeting her? Um, I'm guessing it was the big breakfast. I must be the absolute most envied woman in the entire country because Jason's kissing... Yeah, because I'm married to Bob <laughs> and because Jason's kissing my arm. You can ask me what I was thinking then. I was thinking, don't fancy Jason. It's like everybody fancied Jason. They still fancy Jason. It's that chin. Did I was you like, fancy oh, her? Oh, yeah. Of course I did, yeah. Nothing ever happened. Yeah, no, nothing ever happened. Yeah, well, I wanted her to fancy me. Now, Bob was just telling her. No, you can't suck my big toe. Oh, you're going to come and see us. You're going to come and see us on telly. Yes, I am. You know, she was easy to get on with. And I, I don't find that many people easy to get on with because, you know, I'm quite socially awkward myself. So when you find people that you do feel comfortable with, they make an impact. And when it's somebody as exotic and intoxicating and as smart as Paula, it um, leaves a lasting impact. But I suppose... When you think about it, there's only really one interview that everybody remembers, and that was her interview with Michael Hutchins. This is a guest that has everything that a rock star needs to have. Danger, talent, curly hair, and Australian subtlety. <laughs> and for the first time, this is a guest that I want to have my leg over. And it is. It's the fantastically talented Michael Hutchins. Hi. Were you always very forward? Am I forward? What, a bit? And you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite an outrage. I mean, I remember her legs were kind of entwined with his, and he was a bit, well, not taken aback, but you could see he was blushing, and, but you could see a connection. I mean, there was definitely a connection. I mean, the, the funny thing was, she, for years, had a picture of Michael on the fridge. And it said, love dog. And Bob came down and I think he wrote cunt across his picture. And do you think you're going to get married? I'm straight out of the club. <laughs> um, and, uh, what? Do you think no. you'll get married? <laughs> no, no. Why not? We're happily unmarried. Are you? Hmm. Why don't you fancy getting married then? I just think once, because everyone wants us to get married. I don't. I know, so for you. <laughs> oh, it's a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. Terrible idea. How quickly after that interview did they get together? Five minutes. <laughs> um, in the green room. <laughs> I, no, don't put that in, for fuck's sake. Um, Maybe the initial shock that her and Bob were no longer and that she was having this affair with this very colourful Michael Hutchins, sort of very handsome, very kind of desired kind of figure, that would have been a good story for a while. But I think then the media sort of took Bob's side because he was St Bob and Paula was the Scarlet Woman. Did she get it worse than most? Absolutely beyond doubt. All of the things that made Paula so lovable when she was in her 20s. The fact that she was gobby and anarchic and sexual. All of those things, by the time she'd got into her late 30s, they were no longer attractive to lots and lots and lots of men in media and women too, but it was mainly men. And uh, I think that the way that she was you know, pilloried and picked on was incredibly heartbreaking. I would 
wouldn't have changed anything I had done, but I would certainly have changed a lot of things other people have done. Such as? What like? <laughs> um, just the general coverage, you know, I think that's been quite difficult to deal with. Is it breast implants? Oh, well, that's very gentlemanly. <laughs> that's really nice. You could have said it was like Gaza. It's that me. constant kicking up the arse, you know, and that's what made me really angry about how she was treated on Have I Got News For You? Because she got a drub in that a politician wouldn't who, you know, led the country into absolute ruin. And what had she actually done? What, what, what was it that Paula Yates did that upset you? What was it? It's a big secret, though, isn't it? Your breast in <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, You certainly kept that... it quiet. <laughs> yeah, I was straight on the phone to somebody with a greasy shirt in Wapping saying, please discuss my breasts with the nation. And can you apply the rights of my book? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's always been very difficult to be a woman with multiple layers to you. I mean, if you were a sort of dolly dealer, you know, you're pretty and bosomy and where all you had to do was giggle or something like that and be, you know, cute and whatever, that was one thing. If you were a sort of clever blue stocking um, and you weren't supposed to be pretty or attractive, you were just supposed to be clever, that was another thing, although people didn't much like that because they didn't much like clever women. But to be lots of different things were just confusing and pissed everybody off. You know, what are you for? Am I meant to want to masturbate about you? Am I meant to want to have dinner with you? Am I supposed to marry you? What am I meant to do? And I think particularly vocal women. It didn't really matter what you were saying. It was much more that you were saying it. So Paula Yates was extremely vocal and that alienated a vast swathe. <laughs> oh, it's terrible bloody media intrusion. Look, the camera's here, Paula. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Please stop being unkind. <laughs> Don't be unkind. Professional. What was it that really upset people? Because she was shameless. She refused to go cap in hand to these people and rebrand herself as being uh, holier than thou. And uh, she was absolutely pilloried at every, every turn. for each other and when we had each other, that was everything we ever hoped it would be. Were they having a good time? Yes, they had a great time. Yeah, they had a really good time. I mean, you know, they went to Bali on holiday, they went to Paris, they went to Rome. Michael had his place in the south of France, so they would go there. And yeah, it was it was fantastic. And it was great to see them and they were so happy and they were really, really in love, you know? I know Paula to be incredibly playful and get sucked in to things at the moment, you know? And so I can only assume that she just got kind of sucked into the whole, the power of Michael. I can certainly remember when he was going out with Kylie and there were a number of clients that went, oh God, how's that gonna turn, you know? So he already had this reputation of being fairly wild. I suppose there was an instant where I'm thinking, is Paula gonna succumb to that? You know, when he was with me or the children, it just wasn't his lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, certainly on tour, I don't think he ever made any secret of what he was like. So his drug use just was not, in any way an issue. Did he did he ever use drugs when you were together? Um that's not really about the business what he got up to now. What was the reaction to their new relationship? The press. Well, it just went crazy, didn't it? And it went crazy. <laughs> The whole thing with the phone tapping and, you know, all of that. I mean, uh, I, the, the phone tapping was almost laughable. You could hear it. 
perfectly. I mean, it's madness, but illegal stuff. One day, my daughter came and said, Mom, there's a guy climbing in the bedroom window. And I was like, what? He says he wants to talk to you. So he thought it was OK to climb in into my daughter's bedroom, scared the living daylights out of her, and then said, no, no, it's OK, I just want to speak to your mum. So that was OK. The papers had to be filled every single day, and if they were, you know, scandalous stories, all the better. All the more, all the more chance of getting on page one. How do you feel being part of that? I was doing my job, is what I felt, and, you know, my job was to report on a story that was of public interest. I look back on it now, I, you know, I, I don't regret anything because I, I, I just don't. You know, I did, I did what I did at the, at the time for the right reasons, but I think um, I could see how sometimes it would be too much for people and um, that's not a nice feeling, really. You know, I look back on that night as just being the best night I ever, ever had with Michael. The most fun. I've never laughed so much as Michael delivering a baby with the midwife. And I was so sort of on my best behaviour because he hadn't had a child before. I wanted him to have good memories for the next 27 of them. And then, you know, it only took a few hours and there she was. It was really, it was great. She was fantastic. Really. It's like being a new dad, Mike. It's, um... It's beautiful. I mean, it's fantastic. I'm a cloud nine. Michael looked so happy. He was so proud of his little child. Well, Michael was born uh, just after my 12th birthday. We had this relationship where I was his sister, but I was his mother too. This is uh, very soon after Tiger was born. It's at uh, Michael's villa. Paula with Mother and Ross. They all just really loved this photograph, and... Mm. The press surrounding that whole thing with Michael and Paula in London was a big deal. At some stage, he said to me, you know, it's like people know where I'm going. He said, how do they know when I get a car, they know where I'm going, they're there before I am. You know, I had my suspicions that, that Paula was making some calls, even though I didn't really know her well, but there was something about her background that made me think, yes, they knew where he was going. He said, they're always waiting for me with their cameras. It's just really hard to live here. I suspect there were people in the press she liked and people she violently didn't like, because being Paula, there'd be no halfway measures. Pretty much everyone on tabloid newspaper was not someone she was going to like very much. Rock and Roll's most talked about couple were attending the glitzy opening of Sydney's IMAX theatre last night. At the same time, detectives were raiding their London home. Acting on a warrant, police seized plastic bags containing a substance believed to be opium. I think the beginning of the end of that was obviously the drugs bust. That, that caused huge, obviously, upset, worry and... Then the press were like, you know, now we've got them. Now we've got them. Suffice to say, he certainly wouldn't have dreamt of using any drugs in a fam in his. Yeah. But you're no, I think that, that never came I into think the family be... life. No, it didn't. So it wasn't like a police raid. No, not at all. The police didn't bust them, did they? You know, the nanny oh, found them. Paula Yates has arrived back in London to do battle with her former husband, Bob Geldof, over the custody of their children. She cut short her Australian trip after a drug raid on the London home she shares with her partner, Michael Hutchins. Well, I've just come back to fight for the custody of my children. I've had to leave Tiger behind in Australia with her dad. 
In the end, there were no charges, but, you know, it's still there in the press, so that's still true. Basically, the kids were going to go out with Paula. Michael had arranged it all. He'd run into this house. Everything was going to be great. He was very excited to have the girls come. Bob decided against letting the girls go to Australia. Um, and so we had to go back into court. And then I couldn't get, get to, to Australia unless I'd left my girls behind. Michael hated to be away from us, absolutely found it almost unbearable. And I think it was crushing disappointment when I rang him and told him. And it's funny because I left the court and I turned to my barrister and I said, this will kill my people. Welcome, please, Paula Yates. <laughs> well, Paula, I must say I found this a fascinating book, but it is rather an unusual subject, isn't it? Yeah. What gave you the inspiration to write this book? What happened in the first place was I was trying to think of a way I could get my picture on a book. Right. I wasn't bothered about writing anything or anything else. I just yeah. wanted to have a photo session. How do you else. approach a rock star and ask him to pose in his underpants? It's quite hard. You get them drunk and say, get them off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, why did you stop at the underpants? Because I don't want to see their willies. I mean, <laughs> she said she was laying in bed one morning and she saw... <laughs> A pair of Bob's underpants lying at the end of the bed over some post on the end of the bed, and she thought that'd be a good idea, get them all to wear their underpants and make a book. She did it. You know, that was Paula. What she went out to do, she did. Which is your favourite picture in the book, and there's part of you to choose from? <laughs> my cover picture's my favourite picture. Okay, well, thanks a lot for coming in, and uh, I really enjoy seeing your book. I hope I can take a picture of you and your underpants someday. Uh, Graham, did she enjoy being? No, she loved being famous. In them days, she loved it. She had columns everywhere. She loved being on all the shows. She loved talking. Well, Paula, I know that you write a column for a, a music paper, and it's a very sharp... I, I find it a very amusing column. I love it. And I wondered why a lady who writes as well as you do would want to do a nude photo layout like you did for Penthouse. Was to it make money. To make money, just for the money? Yeah. Because you didn't even have on underpants. No, but I didn't <laughs> realise my backside would look like a scalded ham when I did it. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that's what I thought. I thought, well, here is this beautiful girl posing in Penthouse, and yet when she takes pictures of rock stars, they've got their knickers on. <laughs> and I you did you hadn't thought that, in fact, Jackie. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I, I, I think the book is... Going Jackie to be Collins great. wrote novels, loads of them, to huge acclaim, enormous success, and earned herself a great deal of money just through the power of her pen. So I think what Jackie Collins is trying to say to Paula Yates here, under the guise of, hey, we're all part of the sisterhood, you know, you know, it's really great to see you here, you know, I really admire what you've written, so why did you get your butt out? Why did you need to be naked? And really, my, my view about this, my response to this is, what's it got to do with Jackie Collins? Well, what's in your future, Paula? What do you want to do? In the near future? Uh-huh. Well, I'd like to do a cat food commercial. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Paula, it was very nice to talk to you tonight. Thanks Thank you lot. very much. Bye -bye. You know, Paula Yates would be one of the first feminists to realise that going on television or standing up in the media and trying to talk about anything to do with women and supporting them in their lot goes down very badly. You've had what could be called a colourful career. Mm. I mean, with pop and lingerie and perfume and motherhood now. Motherhood's the thing, isn't it, for you? You've found your niche. Um, 
Yeah, I think, I think that I like it very much. And I think that one of the nice things about it is um, the more children you have, the more you realise how fantastic it can be at home. And so with my new book, Terry... <laughs> Not another one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was actually loath to say it. But the new book, one of the things that primarily it's about is the fact that in the media nowadays, lots of people, they really plug how great it will be for women to be out there working. And it's very rarely said how great it can be at home. So this is from Paula Yates's book, The Fun Starts Here, A Practical Guide to the Bliss of Babies. Many couples have found that their lovemaking difficulties arose because they always made love once they went to bed. And of course, as any new mother will tell you, the minute she's in bed, she's unconscious. Sometimes merely changing the routine by either going to bed earlier or making love in different places removes the pressures of the bedroom. Just talking to your partner about how you feel means that neither of you will allow misconceptions to blow up out of all proportion, keep communication open at all times, and have sex on the kitchen table. I mean, I think, to me, that shows all the kind of contradictions and complexities of Paula Yates, because in that one paragraph, you can see that she, A, is kind of acknowledging that it's not all that sexy to be a new parent. B, you're knackered, you're absolutely exhausted. Sex is the lowest, lowest thing on your list. But C, she's got to put have sex on the kitchen table to give it that sort of Paula-esque flourish. But as with many parts of her life, you're not sure she really means it. And you're not sure it's all that sincere. And you're not sure she'd even think of taking her own, in inverted commas, advice. There are a thousand books put out like this a year now. You know, this is Paula talking about breastfeeding and your pelvic floor and getting your body back and trying to shag when you've just had a baby and trying to stay sexy and the, the monotony, but also the joys of being in the house. And is it nice to be a housewife? And like, what does housewife mean? And like, you know, the, this, this is the bloody bread and butter of what every women's magazine is about now, you know? And she got so much crap for it. I'd read in one of the papers today that the journalist was saying how she was ready to knock your head off. I know. Because she felt, you know, it was anti-feminist and all the rest of it. You've no time for, or at least, you're four, know, you're four women staying at home with, with the babies. I think that it's not at all anti-feminist. And I think that the whole point of feminism was surely that instead of trying to have it all and juggling everything, you know, you go out to work, you have your time with the baby, and then you have to do all the washing up because your husband won't do it, because husbands don't. <laughs> well, it's true, isn't it? Everyone always pretends that there's new men. There are no new men. Very... And I'm not being sexist. Most men, they don't do nappies, they don't wash bottoms, they don't wash their own bottom if they can avoid it. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. Hey, you see, Paula, she'd have a basket in one hand and a baby on the other, and she was tiny. I don't know how she did it, because she was tiny, and she'd I'd give you back, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, because it had balanced her out. Paula was a friend of mine, and I was a makeup artist. We met 19, 1992, 93, and stayed friends with her ever since. How is she different on camera, or her persona? How is she different to, to in real life? She was quieter in real life, and she was quite... You know, she loved being with the kids. She was a mum. When you read some of the books, it's all about the village life and, you know, baking cakes. And that was her, like, you know, escape. Sounds like a really innocent time. It was. When does that start to change? And how did you see that affecting Paul? When she got together with Michael, that's when everyone seemed to go for her. It was very much like she was the bad person. She'd destroyed a life. And then, you know, things happened. I think we just waited all our lives for each other and when we had each other, it was everything we ever hoped it would be. You know, I, I, I could not have lived without her. bad to be without her. Detectives say they're baffled about the circumstances of the death of the lead singer of the group in excess, but the rock star Michael Hutchins was found in the Sydney hotel room. 
There were a number of uh, prescribed medications uh, located at the scene and uh, they were taken uh, by the scientific police. So we're, we're talking syringes or something? No, I'm talking about prescribed medication. I got a phone call about two in the morning. It was John Martin, who was the NXS tour manager. And he said he'd been trying to get hold of Paula, but no one's answering the phone. And Michael's dead. And I went, oh my God, I need to get to Paula's. So I got to Paula's, I had a key, I let myself in. And as I opened the door, Paula was on the steps. I said, it's Michael. And she just said, no, no, no. And literally punched me and said, please don't say that. Don't say it, don't say it. I have to stop it. London is just waking up to this tragic news and the reaction already is one of deep shock. At the couple's home in London, Miss Yates was said to be devastated. And by this time there was, I mean, the street was full of press. Anthony Burton, who is Paula's well, sister and great friend, had gone out and given the statement. She's devastated. If there was anything further to say, well, we learn more than it'll be said, but not at this stage. And I took the children to Bob's house. I would ask that you do not even take photographs of them getting into the car and going off. Gotcha. That's all we need. And I was driving down the King's Road back to the house. And on the radio, it said that Michael Hutchins had been found hanged. And I was, I, I stopped the car and I was like, oh my God, oh my God. I just presumed that it was a drugs overdose. No one had said anything to me about anything else. She was completely distraught and she said he wouldn't have left me, he wouldn't have left our baby. And it was then tabloid frenzy. Do me a favor, can you please go to the end of the road? Please. You know, she walked out of that house to go to the airport the the and it was like everybody was there or wanting a story or wanting an angle on something. You know, the press had decided that she didn't qualify being allowed any respect, really. What she had in her was just drained. You can only take so much. And I think, you know, God, Lord, what she took. That night, what a fucking night that was. The longest journey for Paula Yates began at her London home tonight. Grieving for Michael Hutchins and accompanied by their daughter, she headed for a flight to Australia. I mean, even on the plane, journalists, because they'd all booked the same flight, and even on the plane, they wanted a comment. <laughs> like, really? Really. The waiting press saw nothing of her at Sydney Airport. This the only glimpse as she arrived at the morgue. She'd wanted to see her partner's body. Never, I've never seen any death. Have you ever seen any death? No, no. It's really weird when you hold like, like, like I, I mean, you are like ice. Mm. And I made the morgue through Sunday. We'll do that. Michael's body was cremated. The ashes, we're being told that Paula Yates is taking those back to the UK with her and her 16-month-old daughter, Tiger Lily. They're reportedly flying home tomorrow.
When we came back from Australia after the funeral, there was a load of press outside the house. They said they were about to reveal a secret, something about her mum and dad. The whole thing just seemed like when you really, really thought it couldn't get any worse, it absolutely got to the worst point possible. Explain to me Jess Yates. Jess Yates was this kind of avuncular figure, like a kind of ageing country priest or vicar who presented this programme called Stars on Sunday. He was completely light entertainment, brackets religious. <laughs> if you can imagine that. So, um, so that was Jess Yates. You know, the romance of the sea is never very far away here in Zandino. He was like this kind of religious father figure <laughs> on TV. And that was his image, basically. Paula, I think she sort of always kind of gravitated towards her father because her father always seemed to be the most solid figure. Paula, yes, your mother was... Yeah, my mother was um, very glamorous in that very sort of 1960s way and uh, used to trot off to Paris to buy her underwear, which, when you live in Snowdonia, is fairly unusual. And your father, what was he like? Well, my father, um, when I was very small, was, ma uh, was manic-depressive, so he had enormous mood swings all the time. Um, but he was also extremely funny. So it was a sort of odd combination between when he was low, he would be entirely silent, sometimes for months on end, and when he was up again, he uh, was this great raconteur. So what was your life like with him in the house as a child? What did he do? He, um, he had a mighty Wurlitzer, you'll be glad to know, um, <laughs> which I think lots of people have suspected, and, um, and he played that a lot, I mean, a lot at night. How did Paula find out about her dad? Well, when we came back after the funeral, there was a load of press outside the house. And when I arrived, there was a Conservative MP who lived just down the road who'd been found shagging somebody on Hampstead Heath or something. I can't remember what it was. And so I thought that they were there for that story. And Paula wasn't in the house, so why were they outside? But, you know, they were always outside. So I went in, and when they came out, they asked me, um, where Paula was and was she coming back? Um, and I said, what's this about? And they said uh, they wanted to speak to her about the fact that Huey Green might be her father. <laughs> <laughs> Huey Green was razzmatazzy, a little bit in your face. Contestant number one, Carol Waters. A little bit sort of lecherous. I've always had girls, if I remember. So I remember speaking to Paula and her saying, oh my God, what, you know, what are they gonna make up next? She said, we're gonna sue. So she said, please, could you call my mother? Because they weren't speaking. So I rang Helen and I asked her outright, I said, have you ever slept with Huey Green? And she said, absolutely not. I've never slept with Huey. This is an outrage. They shouldn't be allowed to say this. And I said, OK, thanks. That's great. That's all I wanted to hear. And I told Paula, and she said, fine. We're going to sue. I told you Huey wasn't my father. Jess Yates is my father, and he will always be my father. And obviously, the DNA test came back, and Huey was her father. It's Huey Green, that's who it is. <laughs> and she was beyond upset about it. She loved her dad very much. I had no idea. That was the thing. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have done the DNA had I been kind of forewarned, but I wasn't. So I did the DNA thinking that I would certainly at least just be able to... Uh, defend my father. But 
the results went to my lawyers. I made a joke, a big pathetic one, and went, ha ha ha. So Huey Green's my father. And he went, actually, Paula, could you sit down because he is? So it was like everything in the space of a week vanished. I mean, literally vanished. It really was. I mean, I described it at the beginning of that uh, as a blow on a bruise because that's what it felt like to me. She'd lost Michael and shortly afterwards had this... It almost seemed like some unknown force um, was just making life as, as absolutely awful as possible for her. And I must admit that that was the first time, I think, where I, I genuinely began to worry a, a bit about her and and how things might go for her, because I just thought, where do you, where do you go from here? Absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, it was, it, it was really beyond, and um, I think life was pretty horrendous at that time, and that was probably her lowest, lowest point, I would say. And then, you know, she started to take Prozac, she would take Valium. A lot of the time I felt Like, she might never be the same again. I think she felt that, too. One of the things that's really shocked me from all of this is how physical the pain is. How it literally does feel like someone's punched you or broken something. You know, your, mm. heart, your heart actually breaks. You know, it actually breaks, and you can feel all the time this pain. I mean, it's so difficult, it's such a dark time, but is it gradually getting any easier at all? If anything, it gets worse every day. Mm. You know, every night, I just, you know, sit there. I, I don't sleep very well, and I never slept very well, but I sleep very, very little now. And so three in the morning, and you're sitting there in the darkness, or even if you put the telly on and you're sitting there watching the telly, you just think, gosh, you know, I'm not that old. And yet, this is it. It's horrible. In a way, part of what this is about is that, particularly in that era, there wasn't room for people to say this is too much, or, you know, we certainly didn't know about the impact of the press on people's mental health. Oh, I think the press have a huge amount to answer for. I mean, the stuff that they wrote was, A, incredibly unkind, and, B, mainly not true. Back in the 80s and the 90s, these columnists were the, 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 the cornerstone of the newspaper. Anne Robinson, people like that, you know, I remember hearing that they were on six-figure fees. What was it about Paula? that meant that other women maybe criticised her? For a start, I think that, you know, Paula was uh, sexy and gorgeous in a way that probably got women's backs up. Trying to bring women down a peg or two, it's what women often do. But then uh, she gave them endless material. You know, the thing also about being a columnist, and I have had columns like this, is that you desperately want it because the money's really good. Polly Yates is a gift. It's literally like going to the slot machine and putting your coin in and it coming out gold. Do you ever look back on any of your own writing? I remember reading those early columns that you would write and mm. they were, you know, you yeah. were great at that biting wit. Yeah. You know, what I wrote in my 20s and early 30s, I, I look back at a lot of it now and, and think, it made people laugh, but at what expense? I mean, this is harassment on a horribly emotional level. But it, it, it is interesting that people feel that it's OK to have a running commentary on someone else's life without actually thinking any deeper about their emotions or their feelings just for the sake of a little bit of gossip, a little bit of, 
what can we talk about at a dinner party or did you see what Paul Yates did today? It, it's people's lives and it's just a load of bollocks. The problem is, is if somebody says it and they say it enough times and they write it down, it becomes true. The things I read, there no reality to what the situation is. They just bring it down as Paula got what she deserved, as um, though it was some divine punishment for me for existing. Entirely forgetting that three children lost their stepfather, a little baby lost her father. They shocked me, those columns. They really shocked me by their viciousness and their lack of any humanity. I mean, if you make people's everyday life, just going to the shop, taking a kid to the school, hell, of course that's going to have an effect because you don't want to leave the house. You're like, I just don't want to go out there and face that. Well, I'm very exposed. I mean, it, it, you always sound like you're whining, but, you know, you're talking about somebody who's basically under siege for half of their week from the tabloid. But they are outside my house for up to 10 to 12 hours where I can't take my baby out without really? being no, literally bad. pushed up against railings. You can't keep ringing the police and asking them to move them on because you feel like a white Yeah. You're trapped in your house and you're scared. You know, she used to ring me at two or three in the morning. She used to say to me, Belinda, he, he did love me, didn't he? And I'd be like, yes, Paula, he did love you. And she said, this is what keeps me up at night, you know? And it was really heartbreaking. Whatever people say about our snowflake generation, there's no way that somebody appearing on a red carpet in the, set, in the way that Paula started in her worst times would be laughed at and jeered at and made into news, whereas back then, her decline, it was treated with glee. Long before Michael Hutchins died, Paula Yates was already involved in a long custody battle with her ex-husband, Sir Bob Gilbert. Today, confirmation she lost that fight. Her three children to Sir Bob will now live with their father for most of the year. I mean, the other day, this photographer came up to us and said, how's your little fucking bastard in front of the baby? And I punched him right in the face. Any yeah. mother in this country would have done that. Yeah. That's what you do. Yeah. It's like, fuck you trying to get a reaction out of me like that, you mm. little. But, you know, that never comes out what they actually did to mm. set you off. Oh, we'll have to drink something else now. <laughs> You've got another glass in the oven. Is there another... No, you'll have to ask for another bottle, because you'll get a half bottle. Shall I do that? Yeah. We're not being too jolly, are we? Oh, I want it to be jolly. I'm in the best mood I've ever encountered you, actually, Paula. So... Oh, yes, can we have a, a nice bottle of champagne? Or, oh, well, well, I think we should go for the Bollinger, shouldn't we? Two glasses. Lovely, thank you. I see if there's anything we haven't covered. I think we've talked about just virtually everything. Was she struggling with alcohol at this point? Well, <laughs> we were all struggling with alcohol. <laughs> you know, I, I never noticed it because I, I used to drink quite a lot. Anyway, I gave up six years ago, but I did used to drink quite a lot, to be honest, and it was part of being a journalist to drink. So I didn't really, I didn't really notice if someone ordered a bottle of champagne, I couldn't care less. Or just as many as you like, basically. It looks interesting. It's when you met her, did she drink? No, she never drank. She was a famous teetotal in those days. I mean, there's the advert Sorry. she did with Oliver Reed. Monterey Vineyards. And she's having a glass of wine, and he said, oh, I didn't think you drank. And she said, this is... 99.5% alcohol-free. <coughs> but yes, she was very famously teetotal. I suppose, you know, Michael Hutchinson's death was so awful. And I think she really was struggling, really, really struggling. Um, I think drink was taking her out into sort of spaces where she wouldn't normally have gone. And um, Belinda always said to me that her drinking had got a lot worse. And actually, it was, a, it was a kind of a new phenomenon in 
Paula's life because she'd never been a drinker, not really. And I can't remember ever reading anything about her in the past about her drinking. So yeah, I think probably there was quite a bit of drink, drinking going on. Traumatic years that have left her broken. Well, that's true, and these guys didn't help. You know, you, people handle grief in different ways. So she would, she, she drink to forget. She's grieving for the love of her life. So. And for the loss of her life and many other things that were going on. Do you see parallels in both of your hedonism and where that went? Um, we were, we were, yeah, we were, I suppose, seeking glorious escape. I think that we both needed looking after, you know? She's very secretive about all of that stuff. You know, it wasn't something that she shared. And by shared, I don't mean shared the drugs. I just mean shared what she was actually doing, because um, I just thought it was recreational party drugs, because she was dead opposed to coke. Like, if I was, I was taking coke, I'd feel bad about taking coke because in front of her, because she was just like, dickheads take coke, which is true. Um, but, you know, she was secret squirrel. I mean, six months ago, you were, you were described as having had virtue, but mm. what actually happened? I was getting more and more agoraphobic, so I was ha having treatment for that, but um, hardly ever going out of the house. And in the end, I rang my doctor and put myself into a psychiatric hospital. I think, it, you know, it's, it's a good place. It really is a good place. There are really good people there. I had a very good psychiatrist who said that if you pretend you're happy, slowly you will act happy, which is actually sort of bizarre, but, <laughs> but quite good if you're willing to try and go for it. And I, I, I went back into the Priory, had a few days where I just kind of gathered myself, came back and sort of thought, yeah, I'm just going to try and be all right. Mm. And there'll be some days where I can't do it. But then I don't even blame myself, I just look back at it in the last few weeks, and I just think, wow, we're doing so brilliant. We're in the new house. We're all settled. We're all speaking to each other. You mean as in you and Bob? Yeah, everyone's trying to make it all right. So I kind of feel proud of that. That, that was a, she was, that was a happy Paula. You know, that was, that was more the Paula, I, I would say, that I was kind of used to. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because she was just such good company. You wanted to be around her. You know, when I used to do the interviews, and when I finished the interview, I'd be sorry it was over. You know, I always was, always. Those interviews went on and on and on. You look really good. You look up and you look like you're buzzing and everything. You know, you're back presenting in that. You, yeah. You, you, you pleased about it? Um, well, it was a bit nerve-wracking being back at work. Why? Because um, I hadn't worked for five years and I wasn't really, you know, in the frame of mind to go initially back. And then um, I got asked to do this thing about boy bands. I think that the boy bands and that compare to them and things like I that. Don't see, I, don't I don't know, because I, I don't really look at bands particularly um, now. What do you, I'm what, cured of bands. What, what, what are you into now? What? what? Footballers. Fo don't get into <laughs> football. No, 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 you get involved with footballers, man, you know, they tell you a whole lot of lies and in the morning you find that they just want to leave. <laughs> Well, uh, maybe, I don't know, I might be telling you something well, you don't know. They were just smooth-talking, poetry-loving guys. Well, I'm a, a smooth talking, well I'm, a, I'm a smooth-talking, poetry-loving guy, but, you know, You've I'm married You've got a that. giant six-pack, haven't you? No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. I probably changed a lot with Michael, because... Uh, 
once I was with him, the, the need to uh, flirt, which I, had been the kind of cornerstone of my personality, and certainly the thing I was most <laughs> famous for, yeah. evaporated. Really? Why would I? You know, I was with Michael. Yeah. Which is why it's sort of interesting, when I was thinking I was going to start working again, that was something I was quite aware of, because I wouldn't have all those kind of stupid girly tricks to fall back on anymore, because they'd kind of gone. I was, you know, pushing 40. Mm, that's Four children. Yeah. What, so what would very, it... Very, very happy. I was kind of curious what it was going to be like to be working again without all of that... Stuff. Stuff. Hmm. Paula bought a house in Hastings by the sea. Really nice little house. And she loved that. I think she felt kind of safe there. And she started writing again. She was going to turn all the things that she'd experienced, all the things she'd learnt from Michael's death, into a novel. Tell me about the writing then. So, so far, all my writing has occurred during the fair weather. And, right. um, it's going all right, you know, and I'm lucky enough that I did have not constant diaries because they're too nauseating and I wouldn't have kept it up, but I had enough diaries that I've been able to do the bits that I actually think people are most interested in, which is the bit where it's immediately after somebody dies, where you go to a mental in institution, where you're in the bedroom next to a sex addict, where you have him wanking air into the wall next to your head every time you're fucking reading the Bible. Who was this? I, I was put next door to a sex addict at the Priory the first time I went in. Oh, who had to then be moved. Yeah. Because he said I was interfering with his treatment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all sorts of, you know, it's just kind of observations of the fact that you're in these places that normally you'd never be in. Unbelievable. Oh, and Not you totally. say it started in the mortuary? Yeah, it starts in the mortuary and goes on from there. It's called Sex and Death. What's it like thinking back to that period now? Now looking at it, I can't believe how she actually dealt with it at the time and came through it. And she had, she'd really got herself, she loved going to Hastings and that was where I probably had some of the nicest times with her. She took Tiger on the beach, went and got fish and chips because it's famous for its fish and chips, Hastings. So I chat, chatted, always chatted about Michael. She was going to do a new book. You know, she'd really got herself, she'd been clean for two years. So she really, she'd really got herself together. This was a little bolt hole of some sort, was it? We used to go down quite often. Um, it was just a hiding place. Did anyone ever find you? Yeah. Press one, no. That made it the great lesson to be learned from this interview is if you want to be secretive about things, one is, you know. You can keep a secret if you really try. So we came back, I think on a Tuesday, at Charing Cross Station, and then said goodbye to her, and then the next time I saw her was after she died. I mean, people keep saying to me, you know... She'll die. No, Everyone no, says no, that to me. No. I know they do. It's kind of a weird feeling that everyone's waiting for you to die. You know you know the story about I got sent my um, obituary by accident by one of the tabloids. Headline, Suicide Blonde. But I hadn't died. I was there at the house and they sent it to me. They just had a great headline. When I read all these articles just waiting for me to die, I just think, well, fuck you, I'm not dying. This afternoon, the body of Paula Yates was removed from her home in Notting Hill, West London. A friend who called to see her this morning found her in bed. Scotland Yard said her death was being treated as suspicious. Police arrived at the scene and life was pronounced extinct at 11.15am. 
The body has been taken to Westminster Mortuary and there will be a post-mortem examination and an inquest. Was it a shock when she died? Oh. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it was a major shock. Um, as I'd seen her the night before. Yes, it was a shock. I mean, it was definitely an accident. There's no way, no way on earth I could ever imagine her doing something like that. I'd been for a run, and I came back, and my phone just had a load of messages in it. Have you heard about Paula? I thought, what's she done now? <laughs> She wanted to move on with her life, and probably when she died, it's the best place I've seen her, ironically, for a, a very long time. And, you know, as the coroner said, had she been an habitual drug user, this would not have killed her. But she took illegal drugs for the first time in two years, and your body says, no, I don't want it. And so she died. Yeah, it was a big shock. Her inquest heard in recent months she had been back on track, relaunching her career. One witness said she was fed up to be back in London, but all said she had stopped taking drugs. And it was an intolerance to drugs that cost her her life. Paula Yates took some heroin, her body couldn't handle it, and she died. The coroner said her behaviour was foolish and incautious, but he couldn't accept that she would take her life while her daughter was in the house. He recorded a verdict of death after non-dependent abuse of drugs. For the next five months, you're going to be able to see live music, interviews, my stomach getting bigger week by week. In fact, things that have never before seen on a live TV show. She should be remembered as a vivacious trailblazer to a million little girls that there is an exciting fabulous life out there and you should give precisely no shits what anyone thinks about you with interviews i tend to uh, just ask what i want to know and i want to know what cliff richard does in his spare time just as much as i want to know what sort of a kisser simon le bon is no well, that was a quick link, you see, from Steve to Duran Duran, who are sitting here. I'll just move my leg. Oh, get off! And now, tell me a bit about your video project I've been hearing a lot about. Oh, we don't want to talk about videos. We thought this programme was supposed to be full of trivia and trite sexual in innuendo, you know? I'm moving on to the trite sexual innuendo in a minute. She was such a flirt. She'd ask questions that... You wouldn't be able to ask some questions today of these people because it, it'd be stopped straight away. It wouldn't be aired. It took great amounts of prayer to get Sting into his trousers for this interview. He spent the last 15 minutes in his dressing room with a grease shoehorn. But now, before any more girls faint, here is the man that Elvis Costello once said should be told to stop singing that silly Jamaican accent. No, she was fun. She was just... she was fun to be with. Journalist, photographer and fab girl about town, Paula Yates. Oh, I don't think of her death, really. I, I think of her as being alive. It's Paula. It's Paula because she was so alive. Oh, I'm always going to remember the fun aspect of uh, this bundle of energy and frivolity. You know how I feel. I believe that she was some type of goddess. You know how I feel. She was very, very much about a woman being her own self. And she was bright enough and eloquent enough to do that. Because, I mean, women all look in, in the mirror and inevitably think that they're fat and repellent, whereas men look in the mirror and they think, hey, I'm pretty gorgeous. Really? Yeah. She was such a groundbreaking person in her day and, you know, brought such a joy to the screen. I was always involved with these sort of poetical, droopy types, sort of like Jeremy Irons without trousers. <laughs> Sadly, I never actually came picture. across what Jeremy picture. Irons without his trousers, <laughs> but I tried hard. And paved the way for lots of other people in this Danish who, you know, wouldn't be able to do the kind of presenting that they do if Paula hadn't done it first. Now, this is a fantastic moment for me because it is the first time ever that somebody has come three times on the bed. Give me some marriage tips. 
big boy. All right. She was part of that movement that was the change in TV. Ding dong. <laughs> so I've heard. She was absolutely one of a kind. Few people realise that my links with the mod started before I was even born, when Pete Townsend asked my mother out. You know, I can imagine her being like, for instance, a brilliant um, interviewer on Desert Island Discs, for instance. No one could do, could, could talk to people the way Paula did. She could be pretty much all things to all people. She could be wicked, rude, crude. She could be incredibly, incredibly intelligent. You know, you really did not know with her, I think, the person that you were going to get. But you did know it was never going to be boring. Talk to her now, what would you say? Fancy going out for lunch? No. What would I say to her? What would I say to her? I don't know. I would just be very happy to see her face. Do you ever, do you ever sort of look back and do you, do you ever think, I wish I hadn't got involved in the rock world? Oh, God, no. So, I mean, looking back when you were 17 or 18, I wouldn't. Was there an obvious other, other way? way? No. No. I was born to stand at the side of a stadium <laughs> wearing an apron. <laughs> I can't imagine ever having me go out with anyone who couldn't fill a stadium. So it was always rock and roll? Yeah. <laughs>